Welcome to the Extraordinary Being Movement, where we inspire you to take action, influence you to create change, and motivate you for success. Hi, I'm your host and coach, Len DeCarmine. I'm Fred Martinez. And I'm your NLP coach, Christopher Shiver. And what a show we have for you today. We're going to be talking about unleashing the story within. Our guest today spent most of her working, her life working very hard to be a good girl. One day she woke up and decided to write her own way out of her own life. Things haven't been the same. Single mama to two ridiculous, unruly daughters, Jeanette believes in a smooth honey burner whiskey, the crash of mama ocean, pencil skirts, vintage panties, and fringe boots. The kinship of the wild wolf, walking for miles in unfamiliar cities that burn down always proceeds to rise, the singular power of dark red lipstick, and the necessity of putting out for the muse on the regular. Oh yeah, and that sometimes our stories are the only things that can save us. Jeanette is the author of You Are Not Too Much, Love Notes, Heartache, Redemption, and Reclamation, available at all major online retailers. Jeanette LeBlanc, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, we are excited to have you today because we understand the power of stories and stories can really, they, they make your life either to go one direction or another direction. And today I'm excited to have you on because I think we all have a story to tell. And there's a story behind that story that really can change other people who are listening and reading it and inspire them to take action in a way that they've never done before. But before we get into all that, can we hear about your story and how you got to where you are today? It's a little bit of a convoluted path. <laughs> I actually have a science degree. Um, I was a clinical research coordinator. I was a proud birth doula and nonprofit founder. I was uh, a professional photographer, published in Cosmo. and. Through most of that time, I wrote in the background, but it was something that I just did as my own little project. And then Ooh. when online writing became a thing, it moved online and it got shared with the world and, and a completely accidental career. Um, no intention or forethought <laughs> involved at all. Um, and I think that's really beautiful, actually, because I don't come into this with some wild credentials or an MFA or, you know, a stack of books to my name. I, I came at this through just writing and just speaking the truth and just telling the story and letting the rest of it kind of fall into place. So that's a, that's the teeny Cliff Notes version of my my background. No, that's awesome. I mean, I, I, you found something that you were passionate about and you just kept going with it and made it happen. And that's awesome. And you're, and you're out there now telling your story as well as helping other people share their stories. So my question to you, why is it so important that we're out there sharing these stories? Well, I think that that question is particularly poignant after the year we've just lived through hmm. where we're, we've become so separate and so insulated in our own lives. Um, stories are always a point of connection. I mean, they're the earliest recorded forms of history and, um, you know, stories written on cave walls and images gathered around the campfire, stories passed down, pre-written word from generation to generation. Our stories is how, they're how we make meaning of our lives um, and how we connect ourselves to other people and how we find our experience um, outside of ourselves. So we find something to belong to. And I think that that just becomes more and more and more important the more distant and disparate our lives begin that, you know, our lives become, especially, like I said, this year, where we can't gather in person, we can't gather around a campfire, mm -hmm. the proverbial campfire or the real campfire and tell our stories. Um, I'm seeing people so desperate to connect. Um, and story is this pivot space where that can happen. The one thing that I definitely do like about what you're talking about is the stories, because it's passed on from generation to generation. However, you got to look at it as it's that experience is that's what creates the, the story. And right now, exactly what you said, people want that connection. However, I'm thinking right now, people are going to be looking at things differently, whereas going old style where they're picking up a book, they're reading it because people tend to be looking at it as want that instant gratification. 
And I'm thinking right now is the time where people are going a little bit more inward. Maybe they're listening to the podcasts. Maybe they're also listening to audiobooks as well as they're actually reading. And so they can actually get that, that feel and that touch of a book. And that it's just that the smell of that book, it just, it brings back what you said, stories. Stories. Yeah. I, we, we build our lives on stories, whether they're true stories, false stories, stories we're carrying around as like baggage on our back. But this is that's how we make meaning of our lives. And I have to jump in as well. Um, you, what you're telling us about your story and how it started, you said you used to be clinical research coordinator. Um, I used to do that as well. And one thing I know about people in that field, it's the attention to detail, the, the, the attention to timing. How did you how did you breach from of clinical research into what you're doing now? All right, because I used to be in that field. That is a hard field to come out of. It changes your life. It changes the way you live your life. So how did you make that transformation? It couldn't have been easy. Well, I, I mean, it happened gradually over time, of course, because I just started um, my my original writing online was because I was pregnant with my oldest daughter, who's 19 now. So this is pre blog days. I had, does anyone, has anyone here uh, remember GeoCities websites? Okay, I'm, I'm aging myself. Um, <clears throat> I had an ugly, terrible floral background in GeoCities website where I shared like a journal of my pregnancy um, for family at home and people who wanted to read. And that was back in the days where if you build it, they will come mm. part of writing and blogging. And so I was one of the early early entrance into the blogging world and an audience was almost guaranteed if you had a, you know, if you had the ability to put words together somewhat. And, um, I just started telling the stories from there and it just kind of happened. But I think that my science background is always important because that's, I mean, the key of being a good scientist is the ability to be an observer, to step mm. outside of what's happening and, and watch it and to pay attention and to tell, you have to tell a true story. Right? or the truest story you can tell to make your way through science. So I don't think it's all that different, actually, in the end. Oh, wow, love it. <laughs> love that. that. That inspires me because now I feel like, okay, <laughs> I, I can bring my, my past and, and my experience into what I'm doing now. I love that. Thank you. Jen, I, I see a stumbling block for a lot of people, I, and I, I can probably even say this for myself. I've done a lot in my life, but I don't feel like I have a real good story to tell. And I know you're going to probably say, Len, you do have a great story to tell. How, how do I get myself beyond that to really start thinking about what do I have to share? What do I have to give value to other people out there? So here's two things I would say that people will come to me. They either say, my story is too much, mm. too traumatic, too dramatic, too ugly, too messy, too, 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 too. No one's going to want to hear my story. Or my story is too ordinary, too boring, not traumatic enough. Nobody's going to want to hear my story, right? Two sides. <laughs> um, but what we know from the thirst that humans have for story is that mm. we seek out stories of all kinds and we want to find stories that reflect our experiences of life or the life that we want to be moving and working our way into. So if you've lived it, if you've gone through it, if you've survived it, there's somebody else out there in this world who is looking to belong to something, who is seeking a point of connection, who wants to know they're not the only one. Mm -hmm. um, I guarantee it, there's somebody out there for every story and somebody who needs that story and who is seeking that story. Knowing where to begin, because you know we're looking at a whole life, like I've got 45 years behind me. Um, where do you start with that? I think you start at the easiest place. You don't have to blast down the wall. You're looking to like slide a crack of a window open or mm. sneak under the door. Um, the easiest way into the story is always the place to begin. Uh, Jeanette, from, from being an author also, the way I look at things is it's, it's you're bringing a gift to the world. Mm -hmm. And whether or not they want to accept that gift, that is on them. It's not on you. It's just you're just showing your gift, showing how you lived your life, your experiences, and leaving a legacy. That's the way I look at things. It's Absolutely. not about profit. It's about giving to the world. Mm -hmm. And and we are desperate for real, true stories. So if you're telling your story, even if it seems like the most boring, ordinary, everyday story, but you're telling it with truth and rawness and honesty, we are so inundated with not real, with glossed over and prettied up and filtered truth, that if you're going to give me a truth 
even if it's a truth of, you know, your boring Saturday morning, but it's real and it reflects like an honest experience, I'm going to see that and I'm going to lean into that because I want something real in my life. Um, I would say there's a few things. Number one, I tell everybody over and over and over again that your story has a power to save lives. Mm. I know that because stories have saved mine. They've kept me here when I was desperate like I said, to belong to something or to see myself in someone else. And I know that because for 20 years, I've gotten emails and letters from other people who say, mm. I found your writing on a really dark night and it made a difference. And I'm here because I found these words. Mm. And that can be a really hard truth to hold. Like, like who me? <laughs> How do I deserve to hold this? But, it, but, I, but it's happened enough times that I know it's true. And I don't think it's because I'm an, an incredible writer. I know you know, I'm not Fitzgerald or Hemingway. I'm a scientist who began as a mommy blogger. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I tell true stories. That's it. The craft and the art of writing can be learned. I, I fully believe that. There's some prodigies we're born with it, but for most of us, it's just a matter of practice and learning to tell a story that resonates with other people. What you can't teach is, is the ability to reflect the truth, and that's the part that's life-saving. So when did you start learning to start living in your truth, being that authentic yourself, being authentic and just putting it out there. I mean, I think we all start out that way and then we unlearn it, right? Like culture, mm -hmm. um, culture, family, religion puts all these rules on us. And I think for a lot of us are, as we move through our thirties and into our forties, it's a process of unlearning all the rules and um, releasing all those constraints. For me, there's a pivot point um, at 32, I was a mother to two young kids. I was in a marriage to a wonderful man that I loved deeply. And I needed to, I came to this pivotal point of having to come to terms with my sexuality and leave my marriage. Um, and I searched and searched and searched for my story somewhere else and I couldn't find it. So I started writing it. And in this case, I'd already been writing online, but I started an anonymous blog so I could tell a real true story. And that gave me the experience of seeing what happens for other people when you're telling really true, no holds barred stories. And I think that that was the place where I really learned to stand in the truth of, of what was happening instead of hiding behind a pretty up version. And there's plenty of my writing that still doesn't share all of the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Like we all have to have boundaries and, and ways that we keep safe what is for us. Um, but that year in particular and the stories I told in that space uh, were game changers for me and, and my and my career, really. It sounded like it sounded like it, it was very freeing for you to be able to express yourself, especially for the part where you left the marriage of <clears throat> that you felt that you were confined and that you had the ability saying you were like a locked up in a cage and it was just in this little box. And whereas you just opened it up. And it was like, I was, we could call it like say Pandora's box of being your, your true self. Yeah. Yeah. That was a Pandora's box for sure. <laughs> Every, everything really rolled out from there. That's, that's happened since. Um, I couldn't have told that story with my name attached in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have told it. Honestly, I couldn't have told it truthfully. Um, you know, there, I had to respect the other people involved. Uh, but eventually I was offered an opportunity to include part of that story in an anthology. And I had to decide, do I add my name to this or do I keep it safe and, and keep it hidden away? And I decided to put my name with the stories and, and roll it out from there. And that's scary. It's not that I don't still get scared when I'm sharing a really deep, honest truth. I mean, I'm 20 years into this and it's still scary. <laughs> uh, but I feel like I have a responsibility because I don't have an employer and I don't have a partner. My children are older and I can have conversations and, and they can understand. We have agreements about what I'm allowed to write about and what, what I'm not when it comes to them. Uh, but I feel like I have a responsibility to speak the deeper truths because there's so many people who don't have the freedom that I do to do that. That it sounds so therapeutic. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't want to live that life, don't want to be able, because they're hiding behind that mask. And they're just living their life, just going day in, day out, doing their nine to five, whatever it might be, 40 hours a week. Whereas you open that up where you are your, living your own life. And from what I'm seeing is that 
being your own superhero, if you think about that, being your own uh, actor, director, we hear these things over and over again uh, so many times about living your life, and yet you are a true testament of living your life. So let me ask you a question in terms of your life experiences. What wisdom and knowledge could you give to your 20-year-old self? <laughs> it's funny because one of my most popular pieces is uh, is a, like a manifesto piece that I wrote for my 21-year-old self when it came out. So I can find that and read it. Um, but, but really, to sum it up, my 20-year-old self, and, and really myself, even up until my 30s, was very concerned with being accepted, mm. very concerned with being seen as good, whatever that means, um, not rocking the boat, not upsetting the status quo, doing what I was supposed to do. I'm a preacher's daughter. <laughs> There's a little bit of my story. Um, if I could go back to my 21-year-old self, I would, I would tell her that there is a whole world to be found when you get past the point of living for other people. Mm. There's a world of experience that opens up when you find that. But I would also, I mean, I think one of the things that I preach the most, and I say preach and people tell me that my writing sounds like sermons. So I think that <laughs> preacher's daughter thing is stuck with me. Um, is that we, we need to give ourselves a whole lot of grace, right? My 21 year old self needs grace. My 45 year old self from yesterday needs grace. Um, and I don't mean that in the Christian grace because I don't affiliate myself with religion at this point. Um, I just mean we need to be a lot softer and kinder and gentler with ourselves and realize that every step we take, every day we live, we're learning something that we get to bring to the next day. And we're becoming the, the person that that is going to be able to make different choices and do different things. So I would be really sweet to my 21-year-old self and tell her she's doing a hell of a job with that. Uh, that, that's that's beautiful because I can definitely resonate within what your words and what you're saying out there because I can definitely see myself because myself uh, growing up within a very religious family mm -hmm. and seeing where I was kind of locked up and you know I'm divorced and I kind of see things differently now it's like the whole world is now just like opened up to me and I see things in a different perspective Absolutely. so thank you for thank you for sharing that Thank you for asking. Jeanette, how, something you brought up earlier was <clears throat> you told a couple of your stories anonymous because you didn't want to, you brought up, you know, a few other people in there. You didn't want their names to be exposed and so forth. How does somebody tactfully go about doing that? Because I know there's part of me that I want to share stories, but that person is still living. And, you know, it makes me a little uncomfortable to get it out there, but I feel like it needs to be told in order for people to get the story. So how can people tactfully go about doing that? Um, there's, a, there's a quote from a writer called Anne Lamott, which basically says, if people wanted you to write better about them, they should have done better. <laughs> I'm not sure I believe that. Uh, I, I don't I actually, have, I've heard her discount her own words too. Um, that's a really tender thing. And it comes up in almost every writing program I do. I want to tell this story. The therapy involved, the healing involved, and me telling the truth about this story is so, so important to me. And yet, my mom is over here or my ex or my child or whoever it is. I think there are a way to tell those stories. Number one could be to find a safe place to do it in. Uh, you know, we, we live in a world of like immediate cycling through social media. I have a thought, I take a picture, I share it, I move on to the next thing. Um, and it may be that there are some stories that cannot be shared publicly right now, at least in their most raw and true form. Uh, one of my favorite authors um, did a masterclass for one of my courses. And she shared that her book didn't get published until both of her parents died. And that was just mm -hmm. the real truth of how she had to respect um, their stories as well. However, I think there are ways that we can teach it. I have a piece, and it's funny because you said being your own superhero. I have, a, I have a piece that's called You're the Saving Grace of Your Own Survival. And it shares three stories. So in this in this essay, there are, there are three stories woven through the essay. Mm -hmm. Three real stories. One of them is mine. All of them are written in third person. So no one reading the story knows which one of those stories is my piece. Um, that's one way to do it. Another way, of course, is having an anonymous place to write, safe group to write into. Um, you can also write 
fiction. Fiction can sometimes be much, much more true than any nonfiction piece you can write because you can cloak your story into, into other names and other spaces and other details. Find the therapy and the healing of writing it without having to expose mm. the people um, that are involved. There, There's so many ways to work through that piece, but it's so important, I think, to not feel a story locked inside of us that we need to tell. And some stories need to be told despite the discomfort they're going to cause others because there is an important place in this world for whistleblowers and truth tellers who are exposing abusers or you know whatever the piece is of the puzzle in that case if you're going to tell a story that involves someone living who is going to be upset what the important thing to do is to build a wide base of support around you and have a plan for the for the outcome of telling that story so if you're going to tell a story that's going to impact someone else and it's going to have backlash Take the time beforehand to build up your resources, to get yourself supported, to know how you're going to handle that backlash, if that's what you choose to do. No, that's great. Thank you for sharing that, because now it gives me a new way of approaching my own story so that I can figure out how to you know, go about really getting it out there to people, because that's always been a roadblock for me, because I, I don't want to expose certain people. I don't want to put them in a bad light, because things that happened in the past isn't how they're happening today. And I always try to, you know, when I write um, and try to write that part out, I always try to add in there that, hey, yeah, this happened years ago, but this is where we are today in our relationship. So that I don't want, because I don't want that person to be placed in a, in a bad light, like today. Mm -hmm. You know, what they did in the past was the past. We've all done things that we, you know, screwed up on and, you know, made other people uncomfortable or hurt somebody intentionally or not intentionally. And, you know, that's been just a hang up for me there. So I appreciate you sharing that uh, with us. With, with writing, do you just work with people in regards to just writing a book or do you also help them in the long as of telling their story through social media as well? Right? Like we're creating various posts and telling little bits and pieces of it and getting it out there as well? Um, really the whole gamut. So I call what I do creative sovereignty coaching um, and teaching. I don't, I, I coach and work with people writing books and then we get much more into the craft and technique um, of writing. But really the core of what my work is, is based in um, offering radical permission to live in your truth. Mm. And so when I say writing, this part, the fingers to keyboard or the pen to page, that's the last and easiest part, right? Okay. When I speak about telling the truth of your story, standing in the truth, it can mean to your journal, it can mean to one friend, it can mean just, just being with yourself and, and, mm. and knowing the truth and knowing where you're coming from. The writing is actually the smallest bit of it. It's just the piece that people understand and it's the piece we can speak from. Um, my background, the background part I forgot to, <laughs> of my, my variable background is a background in uh, corporate content marketing. So I work with people on that end too. How do you take a story and parse it out in a way that works in today's mm world of social media and books and podcasts and TED talks and what do we do with the story once we have it. Um, but the bigger work is always the permission to actually go there. Mm. Like to get to the truth is bigger. It's a bigger section of the work than, than just the writing of the truth. It seems like a lot of people tend to get into the, they can't get into that, to that point yet because it's, it's something is blocking them. It's like they have to do some self-development. They have to develop that, that power and that strength. Do you work with individuals for they can develop that power and the strength? Because like you, you said, putting the pen to the paper, that is the easy part. So what processes do you do? Um, I, I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, sovereignty and permission-based coaching, where we work on that. There's a lot of unwriting rules a lot. Like we ha you have to dive into figuring out what contracts you're living under who wrote the contracts, um, where the loopholes are, what clauses have been added over time, because you can't unwrite the rules until you even understand whose rules you're living under. So that is like the biggest part of, of beginning that work, I think. Um, there's, there's a lot of exercises and prompts, but one of the simplest I'll share with you, simplest beginning places for this, is this line written at the top of a journal page or the top of a Google Doc. This is what I know to be true for me right now. Mm. It seems super simple. 
I have seen time and time again that going into this question can be one of the most powerful places. So the three parts of this question, this is what I know to be true. So true, not a story built on anxiety, not, you know, religious upbringing, not culture, not what you've been told by your teachers or your partner or your kids about yourself. But this is true for me, not for anybody else. And the really key part is right now. A lot of people hold back from sharing things because they think, what if this changes? What if the story changes? What if my viewpoint changes? What if I change my mind? What if the relationship changes? And stories end the moment they're written. Like they're no longer true because we move into different versions of ourselves. So accepting that you're, you're writing or speaking a truth that only is supposed to be right now in this moment is incredibly freeing. This is what I know to be true for me right now. And it takes time with that exercise to get to the place where you're going into the really honest, real territory. Because at first we're going to, we're going to write the fluffy stuff at the top. It's what mm -hmm. we learn to be comfortable with. But I've seen time and time again, that if you use that prompt over and over again, um, and, and kind of pull yourself a little bit deeper each time that you'll start to get to, to what really needs to be said and the stories that really need to be told. That being said, I'm a huge proponent. I call it writing the labyrinth. Have you guys ever walked a labyrinth? Yeah, the movie? No, no, Walk the Labyrinth, like an actual. Oh, oh okay, yes. yes. Um, like at a Zen place or. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, get to the, we get to this place of wanting to write or tell our story. And again, it doesn't have to be writing in a book form. It doesn't have to be wherever you want to live in truth with your story. We want to jump right to the center, to the hardest part, to the biggest moment, right? Mm -hmm. Which can trigger us, um, can be completely unsafe, um, it can bring up all kinds of things. You can get the backlash from other people. When you walk a labyrinth, you don't go right to the center. You kind of go in and then you go back to the side and you weave your way in and you're out. It's, it's a whole process, but jumping to the center would actually completely blow past the whole purpose of walking the labyrinth. So when you're telling your story, when you're beginning to tell your story, taking that path, mm -hmm. the Low and steady path going in a little bit coming back out it's actually it's really trauma informed which is a really important part of my work um it allows you to build up your capacity to safely and sustainably tell these stories without triggering a huge you know tsunami of either past traumas or anger from outside um and it lets you do it in a way that's sustainable no i love that that's a great way to really figure out where you're at and where you need to go through that. And, and cause you, cause when you're telling this story, you're going to be going through a lot of emotion. It's going to be an emotional roller coaster, and walking through that labyrinth gives you time to, from what I'm hearing, understand yourself, digest it and be able to move on to the next part of that. Is, is that correct? Yeah. And it's, I think it's really important if you're talking, if we talk specifically, mm -hmm about writing into trauma or tender territory or difficult territory. And those are usually the blocks that keep people from writing. We have this hard thing that we want to write about. We know it's going to be healing to write about it, but how the heck do we go there? Um, it's important to know how your body reacts to trauma and triggers to start to notice the signs. So is my heart rate speeding up or my shoulders climbing around my ears? Am I getting tense? Am I breathing shallow? so that you can actually resource yourself. Um, and I get my students and people in my classes to create a resource list of mm -hmm. activities, people, places, things that actually bring them back down and recenter and ground them so that if they get to that place in this process, uh, they have something to call on. It kind of uh, sounds like, it kind of sounds like when a person is going through this process, it sounds like this would be the perfect time to document it as because you are in that that state and when i tell people being that state everybody talks about state flow focus what zone whatever it is because to me as being an athlete it's it's about being in the zone so you the person is triggered by this event it can open up so many different things where they can go ahead and express what are they feeling right now just exactly what you said and they're writing that out there and, and in order to get into that particular time of event of like there's something traumatic, go back to that particular time and write what you're feeling and what you're, what you're, what you saw. And I, and writing that out, being very descriptive because that shows the true essence of what is going on in that particular moment. So when somebody's reading that, they can feel it. They can, it's like the words are just dropping, dropping out. Yeah. 
Um, and, and just a caveat to add to that is it's really important to make sure that you do that in a safe and sustainable way because I've seen too many times the opposites happen that we think we have the capacity to write these really challenging things and we actually re-trigger ourselves or, or set our healing back. So I just think it's really important to, to pay attention to where our bodies are at, what's around us, how resourced we are um, in order to do that. And, and I also want to mention, you know, you'd mentioned before working with business owners and how this kind of all plays in here. I think that goes back to the hunger for stories. Like we want to connect with the people. Um, we want to cut through the gloss and the, the glitz and the how we're all covered up and connect with people. And if you have a business, you have a work you're doing and you can weave these stories, even the difficult, challenging ones that made you who you are, made mm -hmm. you the person you are, gave you the drive, gave you the determination into that presence that you have in the world, whether it's working one-on-one -on -one with clients or posting on social media or creating a talk or a presentation, people react to that. People, it, it calls people in. It's like a siren song of, oh, here's a real honest story. Thank God. This didn't come from a copywriter somewhere. This is like someone's real heart and soul. Now I want to interact with you more. Right. Yeah, because I've seen that with a lot of business owners that are out there that really talk about their story, that the connection that they gain with their audience is such more, so much more powerful than just writing some copy to, to sell something that they, they put together, but really talking about how it came about, you know, where they came from and being authentic and genuine of who they are. I've seen the results really become very powerful where they really have that audience now that really follows along with them and really experiences what they went through during that time of building their business or that life struggle that really makes a big impact. Yeah, you're not just a brand or a product or a service, you're a story, you're human. Correct, yeah, yeah. So I want to ask you this, you know, when, when writing a story, is it best for me to like outline something? Like when I'm going through that labyrinth, start outlining things or just kind of like just let it free flow on paper and just get everything out based upon whatever I'm in, whatever I'm feeling at that moment for a particular incident that happened in my past? I mean, I think that, that story, that's a really hard question to answer because it's a very individual thing and it's based on the kind of stories you want to tell, the purpose sure. you're telling them for, the audience. Um, I think as a whole, I would suggest if you're if you're sitting down to begin this, like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start facing whether I'm doing it for my private personal healing or I'm doing it for my business or I'm doing it for my brand. Um, just getting the whole list of stories out of you, just pouring them out somewhere so you have somewhere to go back from. And like, okay, today I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna write this one is good. As far as outlining or or the structure, I think that that's more of a one on one individual person and their creative flow and how they work question. Um, we can talk about you specifically if you want. We can put <laughs> you in the hot seat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can have fun with it. I'll be in the hot seat. I usually get one of the other guys to be, but I'll, I'll be in the hot seat today if you like. To... I'll play with you in this arena. I think, I think we're going to be taking a couple of days or years on that one right now. So yes, <laughs> Do we, we have could. time? I don't know if we have time. <laughs> um, my question is, there's a lot of people alive right now that have caused those traumas to me that I would love to put down in a book. And I actually have already written down a lot of my book that I've been writing. I haven't told anybody about it because it was the only way that I could feel that I could talk about my trauma. Because like you said, there's I haven't found anybody out there like me. I haven't found anyone at all that has anything like a background me that can even relate to me. And it's it's become very lonely. But the thing is, I know for a fact that I've talked about a few things on this show about my past and my my own mother heard it and that triggered her. So so, you know, it almost seems like from what you're saying that no matter how much you you, you take your time through the labyrinth to the center and write things eloquently and, and correctly so that your truth can get there, the truth that you know now, as you said, what happens when you do get that pushback from the people that are close to you? How, how does that affect you as a person? And how have you noticed your clients get through that process as well? Um, well, I think, like I said, I have, I have a great deal of freedom that other people don't have. Um, and so that I can do this and I can speak in a way that a lot of people can't. 
I live, my family has, my family got to, you know, go on this journey with me for 20 years. So, and, and as I gradually got braver and braver, they had to push those limits too. Um, but there are some times in some stories when backlash is inevitable. Like in order to tell this true story we need to tell, we know there's going to be backlash. We might, it might be anger, it might be hurt. It might be someone we still love very much and want to care for, right? So I think the first thing is, is preemptively making sure you're supported and resourced. That you have this wide base of support underneath you like a mountain, right? You're not gonna tip from side to side. Um, whatever that means to you, having the people around you, having a plan, um, you can let the people know. So you, we trust people all the time to opt in or opt out to experiences um, online. You know, you can unfollow, you can block. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to train the people in your life that they have the ability to do that too. So if your book is going to hurt your mom, she has the ability to opt out and not read it. And you can offer her the respect of giving her that choice and not letting her be. Now, if once a story starts spreading, it's impossible to warn, like, you might find it here, you might find it here. So I think that if it's someone you care about, it's important to have that discussion. Um, and, and then to stand in the truth of what you're willing to keep private and what you can't keep private anymore. My children, for instance, know that I talk about sex online. I've given them the choice of blocking me or not, but I will not stop sharing the stories. I don't share stories that overlap with their story, but I do share my story and that they're old enough to have that, you know, we're old enough to have that discussion um, and to live with it. I have lost family members because there are stories I cannot not tell. Um, and, and I think the process of losing those family members in my life has actually made me more determined to write my way out of every last remaining closet because I, I got to observe family dynamics around that and the way we're invested in keeping secrets. And I just can't be a part of that anymore. So part of it is accepting that loss. If you tell a really honest, true, difficult story, there's, there's going to be some loss. Um, there are so many levels to this and I want to be so tender with it because it's such a really real thing. And it is what keeps so many people from telling their story making sure you have your support, allowing people to opt in or out, um, and then accepting accepting that backlash is sometimes inevitable um, and trusting yourself to hold, to hold that or waiting to share the story until you know you have the capacity to hold it. Well, I, from what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, it, like sometimes you say it's inevitable, but of course the support system seems like the most important one. Um, in your experience with your clients and whatnot, like, and like what I find interesting, what you said is like, when you, when you lost, when you lost those family members, like you felt like it, you know, motivated you more. I, I, I'd like to understand that because to me, that just sounds like, that sounds like the white, the, what you call it, the, uh, the wall of the North and the game of Thrones falling down. It's like that, that sounds terrifying to me. How, how do you do? What, what is that like? Um, I think for me, in, in the instance that this happened. And again, I'm, I'm skating over this because not all of this story is, is mine to tell uh, here and now. Um, I think it, it involves some like stealing myself and getting sell it, saddle, settled in myself and knowing, okay, if I continue on this path, it's going to make people uncomfortable. However, if I don't tell these stories, People are going to get to continue to do the things that they did. Mm. And other people are not going to find this safe space and solace in my story because there's people out there that can't tell these stories of things that have happened with their family member. They can't tell the stories of abuse or homophobia or racism because they are not in safe spaces the way I am. Um, I think that that's what gives me the strength to hold the anger or the upset or the hurt is because if I don't tell the story, and it doesn't make its way to those people who can't tell the story, then there's this, this kind of void there. Um, and I, I take that responsibility really, really seriously. And I think that that responsibility is what gives me the strength to hold whatever comes at me from the truth telling. Wow, that's... I, know, wow. I know without a doubt that when you're brave enough to tell those hard stories, the stories that you just reflected to me, and I'm so sorry that that is your lived experience, um, you will 
help and save other people. There is no doubt in my mind there is someone out there Googling and searching for a story like yours. I can tell you with everything in my being, there is somebody whose life could be saved from reading that story that you tell. And that can give you the strength to hold what comes at you. That's that's really deep. Thank you so much. That's a... <laughs> And, and I love how you said it's about taking responsibility. That is so powerful. Yeah, I think we have a responsibility to the, to the lives we've lived and the stories we tell and whatever privilege we hold. I happen to exist in a great deal of privilege, right? I'm a, I'm, I'm a woman and I'm a queer woman, but I'm also a white straight passing woman in a middle class house in, in a city. You know, I have epic amount of freedom compared to so many other people. And so if I don't tell this story, who's going to tell it? Thank you. So Jeanette, where does your story continue from here? You wanted me to be a future? Yes. <laughs> I'd love to hear some of your experiences as well, because like you're, you're in a field that in, in my opinion is probably because because right now the books and stories that you've written, like like a hundred years from now, it could get picked up and become like a masterpiece. Like, oh, wow. I mean, come on, you know that happens. You you know that happens. And and for me, I think that's really important because especially my background in neurolinguistic programming, we talk about how words and, and stories can literally ingrain themselves in neurology, right? And And how that works in for our past and how that works in therapy and counseling and how that can work for our own selves and creating the support systems that our own selves really need when there is no support from external. Mm -hmm. And, and so, I mean, for that, it's a, you, you must have seen with just your clients yourself, you must have heard some just excruciating stories and also someone that just incredibly uplifting at the same time. Um, you really, cause like, if you really think about it, like that's how the whole civilization got started storytelling. Going back to your point about it could be a masterpiece 100 years from now, I would like to find fame and fortune in this lifetime. That'd be nice. <laughs> um, and I was, I had actually said 2020 was going to be the year that I was going to move more into speaking and stage and presenting and teaching on a bigger scale. Obviously, 2020 had other ideas, uh, but that's still what I would like to do. I would like to take this message of power and sovereignty and ownership of story and to a larger audience um, and to impact more people that way. Mm -hmm. I have probably six more books in the works that I would like to create and get out into the world. Um, and really, I just want to keep, I want to keep telling true stories. Um, last year I wrote, my goal was to write my way to tell it true stories to write my way out of every last remaining closet. Um, there's a Ted talk by Ash Ambridge, um, where the speaker says that, um, a closet is just a difficult story. Mm. So we tend to think about being in the closet as a gay thing, but it's actually, we all have closets in our lives, all the difficult stories that we're, we're not wanting to say or speak or tell or write. Um, and so I think my role is to not only break down the rest of the closets in my life, but to help other people do the same. No, I, I absolutely love it. I love I love the direction and the goals and your ambition of where you want to take where you are now into the future. I want to get some final thoughts from Fred and Chris. Fred, what what do you have to what's been resonating with you throughout this show today? It's about being your true self and just mm -hmm. being able to uh, if you can express yourself of what exactly you want, because that's the whole thing we model. Uh, the whole thing about knowing neuro-linguistic neuro programming is modeling for success. And the one thing I've learned is about learning from Jeanette on how to model that success on living your truth, as well as if you cannot express certain things, just put it out there because it's freeing. It's very therapeutic. It is if whatever you want, it's I, I believe in the whole uh, law of the universe, law of attraction, that what you put out there and you're living it and you're full throttle like Aristotle locked out in a bottle going after it, it's going to come to fruition. I look at it as these are the things that I'm gaining is just put it out there. If it's something that is that's troubling you from your past, put it out there, get rid of it, pull that weed, get that damn thing out of your life, eliminate your baggage. Because when you're traveling, going from place to place, and you look at it as, you know, 
process right now moving and I think Jeanette was also moving too is that you see all the baggage that we have and when you're free and you eliminate all that barriers of that mask that you have and that you are just walking in your naked truth of just saying here I am accept me I don't give a fuck because I accept myself well thank you for Martinez that was powerful from you I don't, take it or leave it, right? Take it or leave it. <laughs> Christopher Shiver, what do you have to share? I, I, I really, I, I cannot stop thinking about the labyrinth. Like that, mm -hmm. that really just changed my perception of, 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 of writing my book. Because I've been writing this book for about eight years now. And it's just been, it's been the place where I go to like put down <laughs> so many of my ideas and my experiences of what I've felt. And now I'm realizing that the way I wrote it was I went to the center every single time and it was actually kind of traumatizing for me. But now, now I realize that actually, so, okay. So if I just take my time and I start at the beginning and, and I find my way through the labyrinth and then come back out, I have this amazing story that I've just written. And, mm -hmm. and thank you so much for your, 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 your words, Jeanette, because now I realize like, Okay, so I need to put this out there. I need to find the proper way to put this out there. And and now I, I just co-authored in my first book uh, last year. And now I'm like, I, I, I've done that. And I put in that book something about me that was very personal that I was actually surprised that I put out. And it got, honestly, it got a lot of backlash. from. It was an entrepreneurial book. And it got a lot of backlash from fellow entrepreneurs. They didn't like to hear what I had to put down. And it had to do with... Are you giving away value or are you portraying value? Because a lot of people out there who are entrepreneurs own their own businesses say like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you value. No, no, you're not. You're, you're portraying it and saying, follow me, follow the shiny thing. And so a lot of them got really upset. But now I realize it's like, well, no, that was good that I did that. Because now, now I actually have a group of entrepreneurs in my group that are now following me because they love that I did that. They love that I'm willing to call them out on their shit. And I'm willing to be like, hey, let's look at the results. Let's look at what is this really causing? Like, instead of a just like hoping this, hoping that. Like, no, put it down. Be real about it. I love that, you know, uh, this is this is my truth right now, right? This is the best way I know my truth right now. I, 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 I probably, I'm probably missing it up. I'm so sorry. But it is it is amazing how you put that out there because now I'm I'm thinking to myself like, oh, my God, I need to do this. I really need to do this because I don't have many times I've heard in my whole life, Chris, you have an amazing story. You need to put this down. I, thank you so much for that, Jeanette, because you've inspired me. I mean, I do know a good writing coach. Just Yes, yes. You're going to hear from me, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeanette, I know people are listening and watching this, and this show is really resonating with them. And they probably want to reach out to you. How can they go about doing that to get your coaching, to learn more about how to write better and to really share their story? Um, yeah, my website is just my name, JeanetteLeBlanc.com. It's also where you can find me on social media. I'm on Instagram and Facebook the most, so feel free to, to search for me there. Um, I am regularly running writing programs, uh, voice unleashing programs, sovereignty permission-based programs, and also um, offer ongoing one-on-one -on -one work. And that's really custom to the individual. Some, for some individuals, we're focusing way more on the ownership sovereignty permission point. Other individuals like Chris might have a book and, and a specific project that they're working on getting out to the world. Um, in order to book, uh, you can book a three a free 30 minute discovery call with me at calendly.com slash Jeanette LeBlanc and we can discuss your project or your wishes or your needs and go from there. And then I also have uh, my little yellow book of love. So you are not too much. And this is collected from my years of writing online and each page is an individual I don't know if you can see it, kind of photography designed love notes. Um, so you can read it cover to cover, or you can just kind of flip through and pick the pick the message that the universe wants you to get today. Um, and my book, and I have prints and a card deck as well, are all available in my Etsy shop. So I, I don't know if you want me to give the URL, or you can add it to the show notes. Or... Yeah, why don't, you, why don't you give us the URL, but we'll also add it in as well. So it's etsy.com slash shop slash Jeanette LeBlanc art. And so there's all kinds of products all based on words and empowerment and sovereignty and owning your story. Fantastic. Jeanette, what's that card deck about? That looks interesting. The card deck is actually the pages of the book. Okay. Um, we 
It's kind of like a tarot deck, so you can fan out the deck and choose your your love note wisdom of the day. Nice. I love that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Jeanette, here, here. thank you. Let's do Why one. Let's, so let's do one real quick. Why are you so determined to keep your wild silently inside of you? Let it breathe. Give it a voice. Let it roll out of you on the wide open waves. Set it free. Did you just pick that one out, or or did you actually choose that one? No, that was just the one that was there. Oh my god, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Jeanette, thank you so much for bringing your gifts and your tools to the world and to this show to really to help people express who they are and share their stories because we all are unique and different and we're all one of a kind. So thank you for being that person that's out there being able to help guide, the, guide people to their story, to who they are, to get it out there to the world, to make changes not only in their lives, but in the lives of others. So we appreciate you being here with us today. So thank you very much. Uh, this is Linda Carmine, your host and coach with the Extraordinary Being Movement with my two co-hosts, Fred Martinez and Christopher Shiver. We want to thank you for being here with us today. We're going to have tons of information about Jeanette on our website as well at theextraordinarybeingmovement.com. So you can visit us there, learn more about Jeanette, her bio, her links, and also listen to this amazing recording of our show. There's tons of wisdom here, so make sure you download it on all podcast platforms so that you can take advantage of the insight Jeanette has. And make sure you reach out to her. She is amazing at what she does. Uh, we highly recommend her, and that's why we brought her on the show, because we want to share her on our show with you and with the world. So we want to thank you very much, um, and we wish you the best. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.